Did you grow up within a culture of a religion? Perhaps like me, you ended up taking a First Communion at the age of eight. I grew up in a Catholic church and I had no real way to differentiate the cartoons that I watched on television and what the adults in my life were telling me about heaven, hell, and a white man in the painting on the wall who apparently died a horrible, slow, humiliating, torturous death in the blistering hot Jerusalem sun because nearly 2,000 years later, I did a sin when I lied about what I did on the weekend. I couldn't tell the difference between those two stories. That same man, whose horrible execution was recreated in a statue on the same wall, and the statue, he was pretty much my size. I mean, I was eight. It wasn't huge, but it's about the same size. Complete with the dripping blood and everything, he was mostly naked in the statue. And this man died this horrific death in front of his own mother. His dad wasn't there because he's his own dad. He died this death because of my sins. But don't worry, come the first Friday of every month, it'll be fine because I'll be able to take a bite out of this man when a grown adult in a dress called Tom will say some magic words over a full bowl of kind of wafer-thin cheese crackers and then will feed them to me in what I can only describe now as a cannibalistic ritual. But apparently cannibalism is bad unless you're eating magic bread, which is now the body of a man who died 2,000 years ago and he died because I had a wank. Actually thinking about it now, it's a lot to ask a kid to absorb. But like millions of others, I literally took it as gospel and I never questioned it because I was surrounded by it. A fish doesn't know what water is, does it? I think I was about 11, about 11 or so, when I figured out, eh, this isn't for me. Because I've been told that I was made in his image, this male god, who I was supposedly modelled after, had the same body parts I had, had the same needs and the same desires that I had. So when I figured out that masturbation was a pretty excellent thing to do with my morning, I was faced with a quandary. You see, I'd been told that masturbation was one of those sins, which the man on the wall, who was his own dad, but also everywhere all at once, like an omnipresent Santa Claus, but instead of a Transformers knockoff from Paddy's, uh, my reward for being naughty, um, well, this guy would make sure that I'd burn in the fires of hell for eternity because he was always watching, and he definitely saw me have that wank while I was thinking about the ladies in the David Lee Roth music video. Um, in my 11-year-old mind, I remembered that if I was made in his image, then surely this was the thing that I'm supposed to do. I'm not doing it to anybody else. Well, that happened later. And if you don't count the days where I probably could have recognized the early signs of a friction burn, I wasn't hurting myself or anybody. I wasn't hurting anybody. And look, let's be honest, it felt, it felt incredibly good. There's no way that if you controlled the universe, you would not also be making as much time to do this in your day as you possibly could. And that was it. That was the first crack in the up until then solid wall of behavioral and thought modification that I'd been living under. And it went from there. Now, I'm not alone as a person who made a choice to turn away from organized religion as a kid. And when I think about my guest today, I reckon I took the easy option. Ash London is a fantastic human, an incredibly talented broadcaster. And in the time between now and the last time that she appeared on this podcast, she has taken on another very important job, the job of being a mother, a mother who lives in a house in the country who grows a garden and is just magnificent. It's quite a shift for a woman who spent years of her career being flown across the world to literally have 10 minutes of camera time with Ed Sheeran before flying straight back to Australia to get back and do her radio show. But what is it like to go from business class and access all areas passes at stadiums anywhere in the world, any time she wanted, to nappies and nobody to talk to except a toddler. And what if that transition to this new phase of her life and her career also starts to prompt questions about the way that she'd been living, living within that faith, that religion, that 
she had, that had shaped her life. Even daring to quietly and gently begin to inquire about this faith that had guided her life so powerfully up until that point. It's such a beautiful conversation. And I'm just so grateful that Ash was generous enough to open up about this. We speak about that. We talk about the intricacies of secret relationships, um, the changing landscape of radio, the struggles of your identity of you, and your career. Sometimes they are matched, sometimes they're not. What it was to discover the magic of motherhood, her journey of faith and spirituality, the struggle she faced leaving a faith community because it's not just one, it's, it's everybody's there, often it's your family. And we talk a lot about the freedom to change your mind. It's a truly beautiful conversation, and I really hope you get as much out of it as I did. Hello, I'm so happy to see you again. How do you do? Uh, the, the feeling is mutual. I'm so happy to see you. Love your cool background. I feel like well, I'm very zen today in your rock and roll. Yes, and you, you're, you're a blur song right now. Please explain. You live in a house, very big house in the country. Well, it's very small. In fact, it's... You live in a house, a very small, <laughs> small house, house there we go. <laughs> Yeah. How fantastic. Yeah, the change, the tree change available mm. for those. I always, uh, growing up in Queensland, I never really could quite fathom how extraordinarily close what I am doing, air quotes now, country Victoria is to Melbourne. It's just there. It's yeah. like an hour yeah. down the road and you're in the Mornington Peninsula or you're in Seaforth or you're in, um, you know, in Sydney or, or Brisbane. You drive for an hour, you're still in it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's why we that's why we chose this place because we still kind of split our time. Yeah. And if something happens, if I need to get back for work or if I forget something, it's not soul destroying to have to go back and get it. You're an hour away. Yeah. It feels like we're in the middle of nowhere, but if I need to be at Coles, I can be at Coles in, you know, nine minutes. So as long as I'm that's- near a supermarket and I can get my bonsoi. And some strawberries. I'm a happy gal. How? I'm just so Melbourne right now. <laughs> so Melbourne right now. I'm overjoyed to have you on the show. It's been some time since we spoke. There's been things going on. There's been you getting married and your whole secret relationship, which <laughs> I, I reckon I picked your relationship real early. How? There was, because I followed both of you on the gram. Yeah. And I worked with your husband. In in radio terms, your husband is the man that convinced me, nope, it's going to be fine. Come to Queensland. Come to Breakfast Radio. I'll be with you. It'll be okay. I'm like, for you, I will. He is a calming presence and and a calming voice. I got there and he resigned because he got (laughs) a mad job somewhere else. And then I was like, what? (laughs) Sorry. I'm sure I didn't mean it. I'm sure I didn't plan no. it out that way. No, he was just offered way more money to go somewhere else, and so he did. My and man. Yeah, so then I was, I had made this huge move to go and work with an, a, a rather unknown quantity. But I still followed him on the gram because of that. Aww. And there was at one point, there was a photo, and I'm a bit nerdy about these things. Mm. There's a photo, I'm like, you didn't take that picture. Ah! <laughs> We're far away from you, and I know you don't carry a tripod. Okay. And then there was something else. It was a white jumper with black spots. <laughs> oh, my God. You know the one. It was a white jumper with black spots, and I was like, oh, oh Ash, you really are enjoying this beautiful Sydney day. And then there was like a, f- a little fabric in the corner of a frame. I was like, oh. Adrian, you I, don't. Nancy Drew, my goodness, that's very impressive because we were pretty, like we we had to be kind of under wraps about it, you yeah. know, because it's always, we we, know, we worked at the same network and, you know, it's weird when you, yeah. And there's a power work. imbalance in that you were an on-air person and that person was in charge of putting on-air people on air. But everyone knows that talent are the real boss in radio, so where was the power <laughs> imbalance? We'll never really know. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> Do you know, Osha, I haven't told you this, but I've got a book deal and I'm about 10,000 words off finishing a novel, which is um, based on, well, it started out as kind of more um, autobiographical and it's yeah. turned into something that's completely not reflective of our experience. But I'm writing a, a book about a gal who works in radio and falls in love with kind of her boss. So what you're really telling me is you are behind the Australian Radio Lords Instagram. It's me. It's, it's me. Everyone thinks it's me. I keep getting like once a day I get a message. I'm like, I wish I, A, had those balls and, B, was that funny, but I have neither and am neither of those things. So what we're talking about is uh, what we're talking about is there's an Instagram page called the, the Australian Radio Lords and it is just memes, yeah. but they are so in. They're so people who are literally inside boardrooms, inside yeah. boardrooms, and have been so for quite a while, you're like, whoa, whoa. you know way too much about who's doing what. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, it is. Like, it's, it's truly hilarious. amazing because the power for so long has been, um, you know, you'll never say anything bad about us because you want to be on air. Totally. Well, well you want to work here was like, actually, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's Fine. so great. And some of them are very, like, Oh, like, you know, that I could name the people that are going to be personally offended by the post, but perhaps that's what makes it even better. Like, just. Yeah. So, it's, it's really interesting. You, if you follow the account, you probably won't get a lot of the no. uh, the references, but that's okay. Yeah. Just follow it because it's going to break some wild shit right open. I'm so excited to see where it, where it ends up, where it lands. Like, will we ever find out who it is? I just have a feeling at one point it'll go too far and that's when we'll be like, this is why we can't have nice things. And a couple of them have been a bit pointed and you go, but still true. They're yeah. not making, you know, stuff up. But, um, yeah, look, radio is such an interesting place now and I am so, I don't know, like you're working it for 10 minutes or five years or 10 years. It gets in your blood and as much as you want to say that you hate it and whatever it is, it just keeps pulling you back and you're always part of you will always love it. And I've certainly got a part of me that will always love it. So I'm always a bit obsessed by it. And I'm, mm. um, it's, it's an industry that's changing so much and I'd have no idea what's going to become of it. And I'm really excited, not excited, I'm just interested to see yeah. where it takes itself because I don't know well, what the answer is. Andy, who's editing this podcast and has edited them for quite some time now, I met in radio and I work now with a number of ex-radio people yeah. who have all the skills, love it like crazy, but just can't bear the culture that is depicted in that Instagram yeah. account. Yeah. But it's really interesting. I think it's fascinating. You know, I think it's really fascinating. And it is, in many ways, what I do love about there's a time where in rugby league, the only way that an athlete could communicate to the fans, the ticket holders, the people that bought the the merch mm. was through the people who controlled the game, Channel yeah. 9 and News Corp, News Limited, et cetera. Now, those players have more followers on their Instagram account than those newspapers have in circulation. Mm. And so the narrative around rugby league has changed a lot. Yeah. Because the players are like, actually, no, we're not into that. Yeah. And it's not okay. And so I'm, I, I think it's quite cool, actually. It's changing the game in, in a really interesting way because the players have so much more control. And I think a, a, a page like that, the um, radio page, it, the time's come for mm. that reckoning to happen. Because, yeah, the industry's changed so much, changing so much, and business models that haven't adapted or can't adapt fast enough are yeah. struggling because ad dollars want to be Spanish, London. That's true. And I also think younger people put up with less shit, like for better or worse. I think younger people yeah. coming into radio aren't really willing to tolerate certain things. Power imbalances don't seem as fair to them as they perhaps did 10, 20, 30 years ago. So it makes perfect sense, that, you know. And I love that they're doing it through comedy. It's not some, like, yeah. gross, icky. It's something that we can all kind of laugh at ourselves with the occasional we laugh at somebody that yeah is actually again, getting hurt by it. Like it's an and, and again it's you know both, both radio and television the are, 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 are struggling with like the barrier to entry to essentially part publishing mm -hmm. is not much money. They could do it with a phone, yeah. But it, the production values, like I, I literally had Ben and Chris from Silverchair in here the other day. I did mm -hmm. a four camera shoot, which included a, a, a mechanized dolly by myself. Wow. When I first met them, when I first interviewed them, that, that would have been 10 people and $35,000 in a full day. Isn't it so true? And, and it's so different. It is. If different. I can do that, 
by myself. Mm. And it's a good interview. It's a fucking yeah. great interview, yeah, right? Obviously. It's quality content. It's mm. really solid. Like those margins are amazing. Yeah. Like what? I'll throw a bit of marketing behind that and mm. – like, who needs that? Who needs- yeah, I can, and I can see how kind of traditional broadcasters, someone like you that isn't you, would be not threatened by it, but, you know, you look around and, and we've kind of lived in this world for so long where your worth is decided upon or, or decided by kind of externally, right? And I'm not talking an audience. Yeah. I'm talking management. They're yeah. the ones that decide if you're worthy of being on air and when you should be on air and how much you should pay, be paid to do it. And yeah. I think I'm still learning to kind of shake that off, right, that I don't need someone in management to decide that I am worthy of X, Y, and Z. And I think younger people or people who are kind of starting, you know, their own broadcasting careers via social media, it's a totally different world because they're learning to trust and listen to their audiences and also their own intuition, and that's not something that I ever had. It was very much like, I'm pretty sure I did a good job. Let's wait, let's wait and see if I'm told yeah. that I did a great job. When you, uh, right after you had Buddy, your, your your son, I say first child because, I mean, Honey. I, I know, like, I'm ha- I don't, I'm not having any more kids and I know that because that's a scientific, <laughs> it's, a, it's a medical <laughs> Yeah, have any but also, children. honey, my dog was my first child. Buddy's right. my okay. second child. Um, and when no, you, had, you, you, you ventured into the, you know, into the, the podcasting world, and um, what was it like for you to, uh, with your new your, your podcast called yeah. New Mum Who Do It? It was what totally was, what different. Was your, what was it like using the skills that you had? learned um going toe to toe with taylor swift uh for the eight minutes <laughs> that you had her somewhere and <laughs> like pressure gotta get the grab but we flew oh, flew 24 hours to get for eight minutes and then fly 24 hours home like you know what that's been like. there i've done yes. that it's fun and yeah. then you're like <sighs> yeah, you get the flight freaking fly status and then you're stoked and then by then you're like i never want to fly again can we do what it was it like using those skills to kind of pour into something that you were it was Didn't wonderful. No, it yeah. was I I was happy that so many of the skills were so transferable and that I was mm. able to very easily and readily. I mean, obviously the skill of interviewing is something I've been doing for, you know, 10, 12 years and that that's kind of the same. But yeah, I mean, I was able to I mean, it's funny. Buddy came early because I got preeclampsia. So I got a call pre and the idea for my podcast was only ever 10 episodes. Five before I gave birth, five after I gave birth. It was my little maternity leave project. I'm just gonna do 10 and then be done. So I done um the first three and um the we were working ahead. So all I, you know, and I got my next couple done, but I hadn't put them together for my editor because we had time. And then I got a call from my OB saying, Yep. Yeah, Buddy's going to come tomorrow morning, so we'll, you know, can you come to the hospital now? And I'm like, shit, I haven't recorded intros for the next kind of three podcasts, and plus I'm going to be like, I'm, I have to have a cesarean, so I'm going to be out for it. So I'm sitting there like on my like exercise ball bouncing while Adrian's standing there with our hospital bag, and I'm like, this week, oh, new mum who did so I'll be speaking to, you know, Miranda Girl, whoever it was. Um, got it all done, emailed off to Dom Evans, my beautiful audio producer, and then, went off and had Buddy, and then um, that experience really kind of saved, not saved, it's too dramatic to say, kind of saved my life. It saved my sanity when I came from home from the hospital and had no idea who the fuck I was. Like I was mm. like full of hormones. I'd come from this, COVID in a way was a blessing because it was kind of a buffer between the international travel and yeah. A-list celebrities and being home all day breastfeeding, you know. So yeah. at least kind of had that buffer. But I I think I knew I would struggle with the whole mother career identity thing and I did. So the podcast in a way was my saviour because I got to have those conversations with women who'd done it and also have something to do and I ended up doing kind of 75 pod, um, episodes I think and then I was like, okay, I've learned all I have to learn about this for now. I will keep learning about motherhood until the day I die. But for now, um, you know, I'm very much that person who as soon as I feel like something's come to an end, I end it. I don't kind of hold on too long. Sometimes I end things too quickly and whatever, but I think it's better than dragging it on. So I'm so happy I did it, but it is a completely different experience when you have to self-motivate and you haven't got a team of producers and 
uh, you know, execs and say, or, you, know, you, you do have kind of clients, but in a different respect. Self-motivation is something I struggle with especially when you're used to having a team of people be like, we need you to do this at this time and then get that done. And then great job. You're so amazing. That was such a great show. Wow. You're so great. You know, like, you know, I'm used to that. I've been used to that for 10 years. Um, So I have so much respect for people that keep going and keep doing and and really self-motivating, getting themselves up every day, doing it all. You know, it's, you know, it can be for many people. It's it's very relenting and unrewarding for a very long time until it isn't, and sometimes it never isn't. But you're still going. So, um, look, I was really pleased. I was able to put something together that I was so proud of. The biggest lesson, I think, and kind of to your point earlier, is that I was just used to everything being at a very, 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 very high standard, um, edit wise, sound design wise, all of that. And I used to get, I would get so caught up in the minutia so early on. And eventually I learned that no one gives a fuck. <laughs> Just say what you want to say, have the conversation you need to have, and people don't mind if it's a bit rough and ready. In fact, they probably prefer it, whereas, you know, and I think I had that bit of an approach to my radio show in a way that was more relaxed and kind of didn't sound like a typical flashbang night show. But, yeah, then when it came to the podcast, I was like, it's got to be perfect, especially because it, mm. it was my first thing, you know, yeah. like after the big thing. So, very grateful for it. It was a great year. I'm um, amazed that I got so much done with a newborn. I still can't believe it. I would. I breastfed through half the interviews I did because I never knew when he'd wake up and need a boob. And I figured if you're going to breastfeed on any podcast, this is the podcast you're going to be doing it on. So YOLO. Perfect. What a way to do it. Mm. I, I think I only managed to. I never breastfed, but I did uh, I did a bunch of podcasts with uh, uh, Ergo Baby on. Oh, yeah. But he yeah. hated it, would you believe? I had, and Adrian had these visions of him oh, yeah. being the ergo dad. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Never happened. Yeah. Not for one yeah. minute. Oh, it was rad. It was it was actually really cool. And, and occasionally, there's a there's a couple of podcast interviews that you just hear these kind of gurgly gurgles. Oh, a, best a in the world. Hats. A few bum pats, and then he's out again. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. You, you mentioned something that uh, we don't talk about enough, and. Well, or maybe we do, or and I just don't have an an, an angle into it because I know exactly the job and exactly the identity that I had around myself when I did that job that you were just talking about, flying mm. across the world, spending literally eight to ten minutes with somebody, and a record company has invested this money for a business mm. class flight, yep. and you turn and fly back, it better be ten fucking amazing yeah, minutes, yeah. Um, because that's all the time that you had with that artist and they value you enough to do that for you mm. and that's the thing that happens. And I absolutely coupled my identity and who, mm. I, who I thought I was to yeah. that person who did that. And yet I've never, I guess when, when all that kind of went away, I can understand a little bit about how that goes away. I did feel it a bit, but can you talk to me a bit about the, uh, the identity thing that you, you struggle yeah. with? It's a funny one because... For so long, especially as women, we're told you can't wrap up your identity in in what you do. So I want to preface this by saying that I believe it is okay for part of our identity to be our work. It was Chrissy Swan on The Imperfects that said that, and I was like, I have never actually heard a woman say that before, and I cried when I heard it because it was just like, oh, I don't have to feel bad for not just loving my work but feeling like my work is me and for feeling like part of me was taken away when I had a baby. But at the same time, the other side of that coin, I think is, yeah, I thought I was top shit. And I'm still humble. Like I wasn't the person that thought I was better than someone else that did any other job because we all have our jobs to do and whatever. I mean, I don't, I didn't see it like that, but it's, what you said about, you know, the value that others place on what you do. You are, you know, so whatever that it's a worthy investment, about $30,000 for you to go and do this. And, yes, and you're going to fly a business class and stay in a great hotel and Taylor Swift's going to walk into that room and one of her handlers has, you know, pulled her aside and reminded her of your name and where you last hung out. She's going to make you feel like you are somebody. So, yeah, that felt good. And it didn't feel good when I didn't have it anymore. And I still have moments in the the mundaneness of normal life where I have to look at 
you know, when I'm cleaning a nappy or today I was, you know, like literally knee deep in shit um, getting my, you know, fertiliser, you know, um, in my new garden patch where I go, man, life is, is very different now. And it's been a lot of being very honest with myself because if I just, if I lie and said, oh, I never, that never got to me. I never believed any of it. I was always so humble and always, and never thought I deserved any of it, you know. But that's a lie because, of course, there were moments where I was like, fuck, this feels good. Like, and then there are moments where you start to believe what they're telling you about how great you are. So I'm glad for the reality check. But, yeah, yeah, I have those moments still where, you know, I think, oh, I'd love to, you know, feel important again or feel that way again. But then I look around, not one of my friends or, and I'm talking like outside of work or inside of work friends, have dropped me or decided I'm, you know, no longer worthy of a friendship. Every single person is still in my life. No one else cares. Like, <laughs> no one just me. Wow. So that's how I need to get kind of a reality check is that my friends don't give a shit. They're the people that I've known through all of this. How do you manage to hold on to the thing when, because as you mentioned, your your husband, uh, my ex, the man that hired me and then was no longer my boss, Adrian, he's an extraordinary, very talented person in the, uh, the broadcasting industry. He is in the mm. industry. He is right in there. How do you handle it when he, how was your day, Adrian? Oh, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, but what? <laughs> well, yeah, well, huh? well, well it's usually well, like, I'm well, going to fucking I kill you? X, Y, and Z, and I'm over this. And I'm, no, I'm what can I tell you? <laughs> Bernard Fanning walked back into the boardroom and did a duet with Paul Kelly to talk about <laughs> thing. And, you know, and then we got the, yeah, we're building a new studio. And, you know, I'm thinking about this and this and that and that. Like, does part of you go like, fucking <laughs> I, yes. I mean, he, he um, runs a station, which means he isn't, oh, so obviously the breakfast show. So every morning at 6 a.m., he rolls over and the radio comes on. So apart from that, apart from listening passively via Adrian, I don't listen to the radio because if I'm in the car, I listen to a podcast or Thomas and Tank Engine music. I don't listen to the radio, but I listen to it every morning. And it's very hard to switch your brain off when you're hearing a radio break happen. And how would I do that? Oh, they should have done it like that. And we, um, we Adrian and I have a, a wonderful relationship in that it's a lot of, um, we're a team on everything. So he's always asking for my opinion, just like I'm, you know, like when I get stuck on my novel, I go, oh, what do you think about this? And he always has a great answer. And I'd like to think I always have help for him. But, yeah, sometimes when he's, you know, like talking about things or I'm listening to a meeting and from the other room, I think, oh, like I want to shake them and go, you guys have the best, easiest job ever, never complain, you know, like radios, like especially if you're on air, I don't think it really gets easier than that. <laughs> like, sorry, but you go in and you talk about your life and then you go home. And then you Depending on them. what shift you're doing, yeah. It's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, a yeah, it'd be, you're right. It can be, it can be very much the opposite. But, yeah. and not just for on air, for, you know, producers, whatever. Like, it's a sick job and it's fun and it's full of surprises so it's not that I listen and I get jealous. I just want to, like, shake people and remind everyone how cool radio is. Like, yeah. you know, that this is, like, you, you, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And it's also, it's also ridiculous when you're, when you're in it. I remember when I first left radio, I could not believe how conditioned I had become because mm. no one gave a shit no. about it. But you Nobody live in, it's a cult cared. and you are in. I like, oh, I had been led to believe that everything, single thing mattered mm. doesn't yeah it took me a while to mm. kind of get my get my skull out of that but it, look yeah. it's a fascinating time and i certainly don't think like in the same way that advertisers will still need to spend money yeah and people will still want to hear other people who can relate they can relate to yeah. when they're driving to and from work or when the people want to watch when they're mm. sitting down on the couch or at night or whatever, they want to watch people that they can relate to and stories they can totally. relate to. That stuff will all still need to happen. Yeah, I hope so. And how it gets to their ear holes and eyeballs, that's the, yeah. that's the difference. I don't, I don't know what it'll, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it'll be. And to me it's, you know, I, I kind of feel like a spectator now. It's kind of like watching from the outside. I'll, so 
yeah, you're absolutely right. But, yes, in some minutes I miss it and some minutes I'm like, we'll never go back. And then other minutes I'm like, oh, it's the best. So, <laughs> Can we talk, like, you've, having a kid is the biggest deal ever because my mum used to always say, because we were weird kids and my <laughs> parents were both doctors and they were very weird and very clinical, mm -hmm. but also very loving, but also very, no, no, that's what it is. Yeah. So, well, you know, you know, we ask about sex and this, that, and the other, and mum would just say, it's, it's, you become God mm. because you create life. And when I stood there and I watched Audrey give birth to Wolfgang, mm -hmm. the first thing that came to my mind, Ash, was, oh, well, of course men are terrified <laughs> of women because men cannot do that. Mm. And the systemic you know, disempowerment has been because men went, ah, right, if word gets out about mm. this, I can no longer call the shots. So mm, you better stay home because it's the most extraordinary, unbelievable yeah. thing. And, you know, me and we've had these conversations before and I use the word in the most uh, atheist way possible when like the true divinity of mm. the universe is flowing through your body and you are doing the thing that only happens on this planet, which is life creating more life mm -hmm. and you're body's doing that how does that make you feel about your relationship to spirituality and the things that you you know kind of grown up believing and mm. your relationship to church essentially because mm. we did talk about that a lot last time you're on the mm. show well since we talked about it last which i think was 10 years ago or something. no it wasn't that long ago i think it, it was, was nine years ago yeah, no, nine and, and a half 2015, it was eight years ago. Yeah, look, I, I yeah, grew up in a devout Christian household and since then I've decided that I no longer adhere to any faith and, and don't kind of, uh, maybe there's a God, but we can certainly never understand that God. And so completely different view of it all. Whew. What happened? Oh, mate. Was just, it a slow thing? Yeah, it took, it it took a couple of went. years. No, yeah. it took a couple of years. It was a series of lying awake at night thinking to myself, I don't think this is real. Ah. At first all I could handle was a minute of that and after a minute of it, it was too terrifying to kind of face and I'd say, okay, think of something else. You can think about it again another time. And then the next night I'd think about it for a minute and a half and then it took me a couple of years because, wow. and I don't think unless you have grown up with a family of faith, gone to church, been taught from your parents how to see the world and what to believe about why we're here and how we're here. All the decisions you make are via your faith, really. I mean, that. like your, your view of sex, your view of love, your view of relationships, everything is, is, is from religion. It's from faith. So to decide one day that it was all not real or you don't believe it anymore that there isn't a God who's looking out for you that you can pray to if you need help and they're going to intervene, that you feel safe in. Wow. Can you imagine how terrifying that was? When you put it, put it like that, you're literally losing a parent. Absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. right. So a it parent was, that you have created in your own head. A parent that was perfect and could do yeah, no wrong. perfect. It could never do any wrong. Exactly. Totally. Right. And you could not question. No. Ever. Like we all know that our parents, you know, are, are, are fallible and they're, yeah. you know, but you don't think that about God. So that was a huge life shift. Wow. And as soon as I accepted it, it was no longer terrifying and it was incredibly liberating. But it took me three years to accept and I never told anybody. I didn't go to church anymore. I hadn't gone to church in a while. I'd given up on church. I, and I felt cool about that. But I always, you know, believed in 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 God and Jesus as the Son of God, so I think it was that, and then it was okay. Like the Jesus thing, I don't believe in, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's still probably a God that I can pray to, and yeah. then it was I don't even I don't know I don't think I'm ever meant to understand. I don't think he he or she or they are knowable. So, but I have a deep connection to spirituality, and I still believe that you know there are there are signs to look out for that there's kind of magic at work every day this whole the universe is magic so that was just so much and terrifying and i and i you know all of a sudden it's like you had a an all-knowing best friend with you all the time 
mm-hmm. no matter what you are facing, and then they die and you're on your own. You're like, but I don't know what to think. I don't know what to believe. I don't know what I really think about this. And all the hang-ups that come with being yeah. a Christian for 27 years, the things that, and there was so much about my faith that I never agreed on, that I just never sat well with me, and I just left, left that to one side. Obviously, I believe that God doesn't care who you love. Obviously, even if I'm in church and they're talking about how marriage is between a man and a woman, I was always like, I disagree, but we'll put that aside. But it's more than that. It's just so much that comes along with it that you have to just deconstruct over time and ask myself, what do I believe? What do I actually believe? believe?" And so often the answer was, I don't even fucking know. Like Mm. I really have to sit with this and figure it out for myself. I'm so glad I did it. But life is so much harder now, <laughs> believe it or not. Every And I was talking to my psychologist about it weirdly just this morning yeah. that, you know, life was easier when yeah. I had more answers and when I could just put something down to, well, it wasn't God's plan. Ash, the, the, that whole thing when Scott Morrison was in power, that whole thing of, like, oh, of course, like he's not being so completely blind and willfully, you know, just malignant when it comes to climate action because he is a cruel person. He's just like, oh, God loves us and he would never let anything bad happen to us. We'll just carry on until he shows us the signs. And just kept, he truly believed everything was going to be fucking fine. Yeah. You know, and that kind of idea, when it gets to that level of power is really scary. Yeah, that was really hard for me to have him in power as I was kind of really coming out of that deconstruction because I was yeah. like, because of course it's like with any breakup, you hate the person for a while before you can kind of see them go, hey, man, how you going? Yeah, good, this is my kid, buddy. I hope you've been well. You know what I mean? You have to go through the period yeah. of being like, burn it all down. He can get stuffed. He's an asshole, you know. So oh, I think yeah. I was kind of there a bit. Um, but to your point, yes, I think I had a lot of e- empathy. I don't know if that's the right word. More of an understanding of where it was coming from. He doesn't. He doesn't get it. Like, he, why would he ever question it? The one and thing I never like- got though was on immigration. I yeah. always just thought, but they're God's, and it make me cry because I'm so like it upsets me so much. Like yeah. they're God's children. Yeah. If you believe that they're God's children, created equally, then shouldn't you do anything in your power? Yep. To give them a home, like that's what Christians are asked, you know. If, As you mentioned, just put it to one side. Yeah. Just, just put it to one side. Just compartmentalize it. I get it. it. I get it because yeah. it's, it. it's a lot, it's, man. It's, it's, it's only you mentioning the time, the timeline because mm. there's only one other person I know quite well um, who has been through a similar thing and for them it was a click of a finger. Wow. It was gone. What? But this is a person. Yeah. That's crazy for me. Ash, this is a person who uh, they – they worked, we worked as a, as a, in the industry together for a long time. They were in the control room. Mm. I worked with them on years and years and years and years and years. I was on tour with them. I was forever, ever, ever. So I knew them quite well and they were a muso. And prior to their life in the control rooms of TV stations, they played in a, in a band in like, you know, whatever, fuck, I don't know. I'm just going to name a band that I don't know. But like if DC Talk was an Australian <laughs> rock band. <laughs> DC Talk. I you love know, that you DC, know who DC Talk is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there was a guy I worked with in radio who was the first Pentecostal I ever met. I was like, Amazing. what? Huh? No, this is Beastie Boys. No, nah, there's a better rap band. Okay, <laughs> DC. Okay, I'll have a listen. No, is that's this- not the band. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, so, like, if that was like an Australian rock band like Skyhooks. Yeah, yeah. He was that in the 70s and 80s. Cool. And they were, he said, we used to play. He said, I've converted thousands. I wrote so many songs that just, because they're uplifting. You know, you saw the, the Batuta doco. You're mm. like, it's they're uplifting. You get goosebumps. It's key oh, changes. Really? He said, I converted thousands. He said, and one day he was in one of those churches. <sighs> and he was kind of newer kind of, you know, we're in a convention center church. And he said, there was a mate of his. And I think he'd either... He'd either been in the car when the accident happened or he was in the car behind. It was like quite close. Like the bloke had had a car accident and was in a wheelchair and had been in a wheelchair for some time and he'd known him walking and he'd known him in the chair. And then one day, you know, there was hands, there were screaming, people going blah, 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 blah. And this bloke stood up and walked. And this guy I know just went, there has to be something else going on. Wow. It can't be this. And he walked out of there and he never walked back in. Wow. 
like that. It's amazing to like, me. Can't, can't do that much. And I guess on the other side of that is that Neil deGrasse Tyson, the phys- astrophysicist, he has this line. I, I saw him, uh, I worked with him a bit, and this young kid comes to the microphone in the Q&A, kid's like eight, standing there in the Horden Pavilion in front of 5,000 people, and the kid says, do you believe in God? It's like 5,000 people. Mm. He's eight. And deGrasse Tyson has clearly had this question before, and he goes, okay, young man, I believe God is a word that human beings have used for the entirety of history for things that science has not explained yet. Mm. Yet. (laughs) (laughs) And he talked about thunderbolts and lightning. Like, that's clearly Zeus. Mm. And eventually we figured out, "Ah, that's actually just static discharge. Mm. You know, along that line. And so to hear the three years, you know, and over time, just Mm, that subtle. Very slowly. That amount of space to be given it's such a wonderful gift you've just shared because it's like, okay, it's not going to happen over the course of a dinner. It's most mm. certainly not going to happen in the comment box under an Instagram picture. No. It takes time. Yeah, and what I do want to say is that my best friends are still church-attending Christians who extended oh, yeah. so much grace to me, and I yeah. wasn't always kind about their faith. In hindsight, uh-huh. I see now I wasn't always kind. At the time, it just felt like, well, they should be able to, you know, nothing but love and acceptance. None of them tried to kind of talk me back. None of them ever, you know, kept inviting me to church or tried to argue with, no, nah. okay, Ash, cool. So it's not the Mormon thing where you're like, that's it, we never talk no. to you again or whatever. Absolutely yeah. not. And I've got so well, many that's friends terrifying. who, that's, that's terrifying, oh, that's yeah. hard, that's, and that, that, thinking about how terrifying this experience has been for me with really no judgment. My mum's cool. She's like, yeah, I get it. And my mum was the one who kind of got me into church. She's, wow. you know, like has never tried to, you know, so I got I got out of a lucky externally. So I can't imagine yeah. how people leave fundamentalist churches like that where it's then like, well, you are now excommunicated and you're dead to us. I, I, I never speak to them. Oh. Never speak to them again. Oh. But also I understand the people inside, and that's been the mm. rules forever, and we all understand the rules. So my whole life I've known that if any of you leave, and that's what, how, what God wants, and that's bigger and better and, and more true than anything. So I also understand that because I know what it's like to have your whole life really revolve around a set of, of I don't want to say a set of rules because it kind of reduces the faith that I had to a set of rules, and it certainly wasn't that. But I, I, I can have empathy for those people, as weird as that sounds. I don't know why, as you started saying that, I started to want to cry really badly because I started to think about like parents, like their kid comes out and they have to go, they have to make that choice. Can you imagine? Like, I'm sorry. But that's sorry, the power Kevin. of, that's the power of this shit that it, that it can, I, I can't. I mean, on one hand, I'm a parent, so, like, yeah. obviously, I, whatever. I love you forever. I love you unconditionally. I love you yeah, no matter could what. Could you imagine? I, I imagine. Could you imagine? Mm. When you, you know, can you extend that I understand? Mm. Like a, a, a mother like no. you, dad sure like me, looking at their yeah. 19-year-old. No. And then going, well, if that's it, you mm-hmm. can't live in this house yeah, and no. you can't come around ever. No, no, Don't no. call. There's no, that, there's no part like, I can't. People, it's the one oh thing stronger, right? It's the like, I, when I say I understand, it's not like I get it. So they should. I understand because I understand brainwashing. I was yeah. a parent. Oh, well, that's it. You know, it's like understanding, and it's a different way to look at addiction rather than criminalizing addiction. It's like just understand someone shooting heroin is the best option they have. Mm. That is the best thing that they can do right now. Mm. They don't like it but that's better than anything else that they've got to do right now rather than I don't care, I don't yeah. fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Yeah. Like it, it's like, whoa, fuck, but how, Isn't that half the answer to everything society's facing right now? Just try yeah. and understand someone? Just try? Just, just try, try and understand? No, if you, don't, if you don't know, just say no. Ash, <laughs> you don't know, say no. <laughs> that's it. No. Disengage. If you don't understand, you don't have to. That's another thing. This is a huge thing for me at the moment, and that's something I had to try and understand was, okay, 
Yeah. Is you feel totally, you lose faith in government. You feel mm. like you can't trust anybody. You've been through yeah. hell the last couple of years. Because I was so angry about, I just couldn't, I was angry about the referendum, that the referendum had to happen, that it was being debated. I was offended by the whole thing and devastated that this no rhetoric is so strong. So I try, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to understand. And the only way that I could have some sort of, ah, okay, okay, I can understand, is this idea that where a lot of people have just lost faith in people in power everywhere so they don't trust what they are being told. Whether or not I agree with it or not is beside the point. I'm just trying to understand because that's all I can do. Or I get angry. I get angry. I find myself getting so angry. Oh, I'm just angry all the time and reading yeah. too much shit and getting angry. <laughs> so I'm trying to um, be more understanding and it's hard, but. I get it. I get how frightening it is. Mm. You know? I mean, if I, and I've, I've been trying to talk a bit about that. I tried to, uh, uh, the idea of like, if you don't know you're racist and that's it, like, well, that is a part of the fucking problem. Mm. Like at least asking, like, what is that? Mm. Tell me more about that. Well, I can't say I agree with it, but I'm interested to know how you got there. Yeah. Tell me more, you know, and I'm just trying to unpack it mm. is important because there's fear behind all of it. Yeah. You know, it's religion. It's what I'm trying to do in, in everything now. I'm trying to ask more questions. Yeah. I'm, Hard I'm, though. Yeah, especially because I think I'm the most important voice of all and I'm the most interesting person in the room all the time because that's what yeah. I've been told for 10 years. So I'm learning to <laughs> shut the fuck up and just ask some questions, <laughs> ask more boop, questions. Boop, boop, the, the it's like, boom. <laughs> Thank you. Just another quavassier, please. And can you, no, shut. Yeah, you can shut the little slider. Like, There's a person from economy in my toilet. <laughs> I'm <laughs> learning. <laughs> it's hard. I know, but, but it's, it's really way better because I, I don't know if you get this, but I so often leave, would leave, and I bet it out, I leave conversations, parties, whatever, and I'd just be like, did I talk too much? Did I even listen to anyone? Did I ask any questions? And it's not that I don't care. I just, I don't want to ask dumb questions. I don't want, I just, I don't know. So I'm trying just be more interested in other people's lives. I talk, Yes, I absolutely. I get told that all the time, all the time. And I also get told, will you stop arguing with me in promo lines? <laughs> My brain just, because, you know, speech patterns, you know, I edit on the fly, mm -hmm. you know. You want to make a break out of anything, right? You want That's to make a promo insane, line. Sure. You want to make a cut That's point. You want insane. to try to get an edit point in everywhere. <laughs> That's fucked up, bro. It drives my. It drives Audrey fucking crazy. As it I should. can imagine. Because I do stuff with my voice as well. Oh, <laughs> tell me about that. I sound like I'm in a telenovela. <laughs> you know, if, if I spoke English. Sounds normal like to me. What are you talking about? I've like seen no difference. A TVC. You know, like I'm reading a TVC, I go, well, whispery on the last line that you never do that to you, you know, something like that. Yeah, I do have moments where I'm seeing myself in, like, in third, like from above the situation as I'm having a conversation yeah. with a group of people and I'm like, just shut up. Just calm down. <laughs> just relax. Just relax. Why are you doing this song and dance? Just tell the story normally mm. and then ask some questions. It's hard and it's wonderful hearing someone talk about how, oh, if I question the stuff that I thought was right, life's better, but it's fucking hard. It's way scarier. Man, it feels good. It's, <laughs> Not you, only in the way you treat people, with your faith, like everything. Everything. But what is it? What do you gain from questioning everything. the way you've been doing things? Because there's freedom in it and you have to really figure out the truest version of yourself. And mm. what living as that person looks like. So I'm trying everything. I was at um, Westfield the other day, went and saw a tarot reader. Now, I've been told my whole life the tarot readers are the devil and you'll have to, like, have some sort of prayer afterwards to, like, break the, the hold of the tarot. I did it. And it was, a, that, for me, that was defiance. That was like, and I was still scared mm. of the devil, Osha. I still walked in there like, my mum's going to be so disappointed in me. I'm 37. But I did it. So, I'm, <laughs> so what's to gain? Figuring out well, who the hell you are. And I don't mm -hmm. want to diminish people of faith because I still think for so many people it's a beautiful way to live. And for many people, it, it you know, like the Christians I know 
are the best people and they treat people well and they've been so gracious to me. So I don't want anyone to think that this is for everyone. This is just my own experience. For me, Mm. it has been terrifying but liberating and it has forced me to just really get to know myself. What I find interesting about, what I find particularly interesting about religion is that there are so many similarities in the uh, ceremony and the practices of religions as diverse as Hinduism to the Quakers Mm. or, you know, Judaism to Taoism, Mm. like completely different belief sets, one monotheistic to polytheistic, you know, religious practices. And they, that by go, engaging in these particular practices, particularly um, chant or silence mm. or uh, uh, abstinence of food or um, a, a meditative, contemplative practice mm. or a, a, a joyful singing with more than five other people, mm. it unlocks things in your brain. Totally. That otherwise don't happen. Yeah. And... I have, I'm fascinated with, you know, the idea of, oh, well, I don't want to miss out on that. Mm. And there's ways to have those things in my life still. Totally. And then there are bits of, there are bits of your brain that only turn on and feelings you get in your body only from being in these things. Now, when, when someone does a, you know, seven day water fast and only, you know, saying, oh, money, but they yeah. for the, you know, the whole time they're awake. Of course, they're going to speak to you about, and then I felt the touch of the deity Mm. and now I am spiritual. But I, you know, that there are ways that you can access that without having to believe in Mm. some sort of, you know, friend in the sky, you know, whatever, who can decide whether or not you will go to hell because you had a wank once, (laughs) um, which was the God that I had. Your Jesus seemed to be quite nice. My God was like, bro, you can fuck (laughs) you, honestly, stop. Stop. You remember how it was hot? There was fire everywhere. You got told. There was pokers (laughs) in your eyes. We got told that shit when we were kids. And, and so there's people like um, Sam Harris I find very interesting. I have his uh, – I listen to his podcast. I really like it. But also his, um, his app, the Waking Up um, Meditative Practice. He was It was him, Dawkins, Chris Hitchens, and someone else I can't remember. And I find that really interesting. Totally. Because I still have moments of holiness in life, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's the, way, the best way I can describe it is, yeah. is holiness, a Gang of Youths concert sex, like all sorts of amazing things. Like, well, Gang of Youths, are you really just kind of dabbling there, aren't you? <laughs> it's very close on the precipice. It's, those boys pay a tithing as far as I'm <laughs> oh, well, Once upon a time. I think they're more in my camp these days. But, um, oh, okay. but, oh, really? Oh, okay. I, I, I can't speak for everybody. But amazing music moments with lots yeah. of people together. You know, I live on seven acres going out, and I had a moment today where I just sat in the morning sun and had a cry because it was just like, you know, and they do say that, you know, the same thing happens in your brain when you pray, when you meditate. There's a reason prayer feels so good. So keep praying, like, fine. But I feel like I have many other experiences in life, like seeing my son giggle, like that's, that's God. Like, what? That's better than anything I've ever experienced in or outside of a church. Yeah. So there's still so much. I use the word magic now, which used to be a bad word, yeah. but I just go with magic because I don't know another word. There's, there's so, still so much magic and mystery. Absolutely. I, like, or, A-W-E, mm. or, I will, I have an alarm in my phone to remind, and I've just been doing it for the last two weeks, I will notice three things that I find I can find awe in, mm. and I try to set it at fairly random times. And I will just stare at a leaf, mm. you know, <laughs> and be bandit healer just going, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and feel the, like the true immense yeah. power of, of this, this incredible sacredness that this is the only place in the universe that we possibly know of that is so enormously bigger than we can even yeah. contemplate in size where this happens. Totally. And I don't think we're meant to understand it. I don't want to understand it. I don't want to try and understand it. Amazing. Yeah. And it's, and I, I don't need anyone to tell me why. Mm. It just is. That's the thing, think I think. I don't need anyone to tell me why and, yeah. like, enjoying the mystery and sitting in the mystery. Yeah. I, I don't think you or I are a heathen for sitting no. and, like, 
Wow, this is a photon that has travelled across space. Eight minutes ago, it left the surface of the sun mm. and now it warms my body. Like, th that is like a distance that is incomprehensible. Mm. Eight, like, that's it's but, eight light minutes away. But then do you know where sometimes but, my brain goes from that? It goes yeah. from, well, that's so insane and hard to believe that maybe Jesus is the son of God. Well, well I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, well, maybe he is. <laughs> But that's, that's the wild part is like because our brains are pattern-making things and like pareidolia exists, like we see a turtle in a cloud mm. because our brain finds a pattern in everything. Yeah. Our brains are going, well, that makes more sense than anything else. So clearly that's what happened. And <laughs> yep. I'm right with that. I'm right with that. You? Yep. Good. Right. Great. Great. We're the Pharisees. Off we go. And that's it. You know, yeah. but rather than be with the, well, yeah, the universe is trillions of light years across. And it's expanding mm. from what? From a singular point and what was there before yeah, that? Right. And what did that point sit in? Don't know. That's good. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> like my head, I yeah. remember as a little kid, I first started thinking about that and I remember feeling the, feeling the edges of my brain. Like, um, oh, that's it. I'm at capacity. <laughs> totally. <laughs> it's magic. I love it. And I don't need to and know. Isn't that the ash? It isn't being with the, and I'm okay. Yeah. I don't cool. need to know the answer. No, I'm a I don't need to anymore because that doesn't affect how I live my life every day. I don't, you know, I'm comfortable with not knowing and I'm comfortable with being wrong. It's one thing, one beautiful <laughs> thing that leaving my faith taught me is just like, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to change your mind. Like we don't really do that anymore. It's okay to change your mind. It is okay to change yeah. your mind. We change your mind about everything. Totally. I we don't want to really... admit we do. We went up, but no, I don't. This is my yeah. thing and it's not going to change. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to step back, stand back or step down. There's bands I used to love that I'm like, no. <laughs> I don't still love that band. DC Talk, not a fan anymore. So I'm very sad. <laughs> You're so into those guys. How are you going to be with Christmas carols though? Are you going to be okay? Well, this is something that Adrian and I talk about a lot. Like no. I wouldn't even let Buddy go to a christening recently because it was in a church. I said he can go to the party afterwards. But I think I'm going to have to bring it back somewhere to kind of um, the middle. But, yeah, no, Christmas Christmas is fun. Yeah. Christmas is fine. Carols are fine. I've been to a couple, I've been to a couple of christening, christenings and uh, it's like, okay, it's just nice to be there. Yeah. And it's interesting to observe. Yeah. Well, if you're Lebanese, you at least get like so much good food afterwards. So there's, you know, if it's not your thing, but the mate, food will be your thing. I can tell you the Fijians also have that. Color. Oh, how do the Fijians go with a celiac vegan? I was thinking about that today when I was making pretty my toast. Good, actually. Pretty good because the raw tea is the only thing that's got the. Gotcha. The flour. Got the whatever. flour in it. Heaven. Um, but you know what? The Fijians who came up in, um, like Audrey, she came up in Blacktown. Yeah. Like. What do you want to make for lunch? I'll have a seat. Great. <laughs> Green acre. You know, I'm talking hummus to you. Yeah. Now I'm talking good hummus. Thankfully, that's there's that. I, just sneak, I just sneak in and don't tell them my last name's Ginsburg. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not you Jewish. Can... I can actually show you, but I'm going to work on. <laughs> Shit off. I'm not that don't half. do it. It's going to end very badly. I'm so happy I got to speak to you today and that you were brave and you were, you know, open to speaking about that stuff with me not yeah. only the work stuff but also the 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 faith stuff because i think don't you can't be what you can't see and for people to you, you know there's probably people in their lives that have you know they might be the ones still inside yeah and you also know? can i just say some people you might do that deconstructing for a couple of years and the questioning and decide that you believe it and that's yeah. great but just yeah. don't be afraid to sit with the doubt because, and really, the God of the New Testament is to be believed. You're not scared of doubt. You're fine. You're fine. Yeah. So, either way, I think you win. You're the best. Thanks, ever. Matey ever, 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 ever. Thanks um, for having me on. Next time, I, oh, gosh. Next time I see you, I am going to cross state lines with some seeds from our home. Please. What seeds of what? Wow. <gasps> um, <laughs> Look, I'm not going to say that biosecurity <gasps> laws. I'm not going to say that international biosecurity laws were. Look, so, somehow we just somehow we have Fiji and bongo chilies at our house. I don't. Cool. I, I don't know how the seeds got to Australia. I have no idea. I love chilies. 
bro. The Fiji oh, and Bongo chilies. Fiji and Bongo chilies. What a fucking sick yeah. name for a chili. You wait till you eat them. Yum, Bam. yum, yum. Okay, Ooh, I'll reserve yes. a spot in my plot for my Fiji and Bongo we've, chilies. We've got, we've got scorpion chilies as well. We that take sounds too. Through. That sounds too hot for me. That How's your worm farms? It's very. It's only the worms freak me out. They're gross. It's, once you, it's happening. Once, <sighs> Just the way once they you move. See that, once you get to the end of it, yeah. Once you see what they leave you behind. Once you put your veggies to grow in that thing, yeah. Pow. Like yeah. it's amazing. Like it's always a beautiful thing. We got two compost, two worm mm. farms, which kind of when one's cooking, the other yeah. one's using the other one. And um, we just overturned another one the other day and we just dug it through the garden. It's like, Whoa. amazing. Mother Nature is fucking, it's unbelievable. First day yeah. of September, I look, work, I walked outside. The daffodils were out. The wattle had blown in one day, the first day of spring. It's, it's, I'm, Irises have come up through the ground that I didn't know were there. Tulips. I cry. Every morning I come out and I see what's going on. I cry. And Adrian's like, you are, you have got problems. You have, a ch- <laughs> you have like tulip bulbs that were hiding. That I, they were just hiding under the soil because we bought this place in June. They were just filling oh, in winter. We winter. never had a spring here. We came, we, height of winter we moved in. And now everywhere I look, there's just wow. magical flowers coming up to say hello to me. It's just, when my when my brother and his husband live, it gets so cold they have to dig their bulbs out of the ground so and they wrap them up and they keep them in the cupboard in their home. So and sweet. then come they put them back in the ground again. Uh, amazing. Another, once the, yeah. Where and do they live? They, they live in in Michigan. Oh, that's cold. My friend lives yeah. in Michigan. Yeah, I guess it's, cold. I think it's 20 below, 30 below there. Yeah, no. Right yeah, so they pull them out of that's so cool. Yeah. And they work again. It's amazing. It's, all about it. it's mindfulness though, that whole thing. It's just being mindful, tilling yeah. the soil, yeah. letting things grow, watching. And when I get stuck, stuck in my book and I can't do anything, I go out and I garden for an hour and at some point in that digging, I'm thinking about the digging or trying to get the root out. Ah, there we are. Okay, I'm good. It's been magic. <laughs> Have a lovely afternoon. Love Hash. you, darling. You're the best. Bye-bye. <laughs>